Welcome back to part two of our presentation of Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. Peter says in this text, in the Acts of the Apostles, when they're ready to choose a successor for Judas, he said, during those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the brothers. My brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who is the guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was numbered among us and was allotted a share in this ministry. And it continues with then his death. Actually, that field, Hakeldama, that he bought with the money of the betrayal is still there in Jerusalem. It's the site of a monastery where her sisters are always praying. It's also a burial place. Hakeldama, the field of blood. People come to Magdala and they see these wonderful icons of the apostles. And then they stop in front of this presentation of Judas. And I would like to point out that he's not looking at us. Also, his name is not written in gold. He does not have a halo. He's clutching the bag of money. What a mystery is in the person of Judas. And Jesus teaches us not to judge. Some people are related when they see this presentation of Judas here and think that he must be rehabilitated. Obviously, that's absolutely not the intention. Secondly, others are sometimes a small few people are very angry that he's also here as a pillar of the building, as a pillar of the church, the 12 pillars, the 12 apostles. As we see in the book of Revelation, the 12 apostles are the 12 foundation stones. We're going out into the deep with each of the apostles, and here we're going into the deep of the mystery of evil. And there are many aspects of how we relate to the mystery of evil, because it's around us, we're in it, we're swimming in these waters. Which gospel erases Judas? Which Last Supper painting avoids him? But with the apostles here in Magla, we're at the beginning of the public ministry. And none of the apostles should have a halo because they're way, a long way from becoming a saint. They're starting. And Jesus has a lot of patience with every one of them. And some of them commit very serious faults. Maximum Peter with his triple denial of Jesus despite all the blessings he had. The presence of Judas in the scriptures allows us to confront consciously the mystery of evil in the world. We already remembered in the first part how Satan entered him. It was night. The suggestion of darkness. We have an expectation that the church is holy. And it is true because of Christ's work in the church. But also we bring all our sinfulness into the church and that's the mystery of evil that's mixing every day in our lives. The church is always being reformed. Each of our lives are always being reformed. Jesus was criticized for eating with sinners. People are sometimes scandalized that the church is not holy in many of its members ordained and baptized. Even pillars of the church can fall, a sad fact which we are very familiar with in our times. And yet Jesus teaches us in front of this mystery of evil and concrete people never to judge others. Paul teaches us even not to judge himself when he was obviously very um, revered for his commitment and total integration in Christ. There's a very deep mystery in every human being in which we enter. The Bible freely presents the mystery of corruption all through the history of the Bible. Just read Psalm 106, in which there are two very strong words. They soon forgot what he had done for them. And the other line is very powerful. They did not wait for his plan to unfold. We need patience if evil doesn't, it shouldn't take over. 
We have to be able to bear our burden of patience and suffering. That's our part also in the pressure that evil puts on us. Jacob cheated to get his birthright. Jesus' genealogy is filled with very shady characters. Judas is a strong example of why Jesus came to save us, each of us. Any of us could be a lost cause. And Jesus, the presence of Judas in Scripture highlights this. He forces us to think about this. We should be very prudent in speaking about this theme because some people are prone to deep sadness and despair, to negativity, which is also a power of evil taking over. We should be filled with hope. The devil does not have the upper hand. We need to mature in God's love in order to be able to contemplate the place of, Jesus, of Judas in the church community. We should never joke about Judas or sneer at him or about him or call anyone Judas, which I happened to hear very sadly actually in the streets of Bethlehem when I was recently arrived here in the Holy Land 16 years ago. It was a very sad moment of anger and apparent social posturing as well. Would you become Matthias today to replace those who fall today? Many people respond to the presence of evil deeds by offering themselves to God to do good. Are you ready to fill in the place for somebody that's doing evil? We need to pray for our final perseverance, the ultimate grace, for a happy death reconciled with God and in the community. We are sustained by grace, but for the grace of God, there go I. And so I ask all the pilgrims when we talk about Judas to say two prayers for me. Number one, in my little responsibility in the church that I won't become Judas. Number two, should somebody around me become Judas, that I will not treat them like is fashionable today and just slaughter them in the social media, but to treat them with the respect and the dignity of the deep mystery in them that only God knows. Come back and join us next session on Simon the Zealot. God bless you.